We apologize for a little bit of a late start. As you could see, we were having to do different things with the stream. For some reason, our stream is not working back there today. We think it's a Facebook issue, but we're not sure. So appreciate your, your flexibility on that. Um, for those of you that are watching by the stream here, uh, we will have our recording uploaded to YouTube uh, later on. But let's not let that bother us. That goes on. The technology world goes on. We're here to worship our Lord. And let's do that. So let's stand together and we'll sing together.
in your promises my confidence is your faithfulness i will church family take just a moment to look around isn't it good to see the Lord gathering this congregation to worship and uh, I'm so so very delighted you are here we have some as well joining us by streaming uh, bear with us we're having a little technical And welcome all of those who are going to join us uh, by streaming as well. All of our promises find their yes in Jesus Christ. You look strong. Let me try to hurry and leave you standing. Are you ready to hurry? I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here if you're joining us on streaming or you catch us later on YouTube. Welcome. I'm glad you're here to share this worship. I want to encourage you and thank you for giving faithfully to our offering for state missions. Let me encourage you to pray this week and continue to give. God bless you. And uh, the Lord will, I, I believe, bless the money we give to spread the gospel right here at home. Let me tell you as well, lots going on this Wednesday. Uh, there's a, a number of us uh, Zoom meetings and so on. The women's have a Bible study meeting going. The men have a, um, a session where they read scripture together. Uh, be a part of these things. I'll send out a prayer video, but there's a lot of things you can share in. And the youth have, uh, I think, a gathering as well. So much going on. Be mindful and attentive. I think the youth gathering last week, did I not? Did I hear that? About a dozen people. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? I'm so grateful, so appreciative. One more thing, you'll be getting an email this week with an emphasis for prayer for the following week. You, each, uh, if you're doing Facebook, you can follow us and every day we'll post a guided prayer and a, and a reflection for every day. It's our effort to gather ourselves and ready ourselves for the future. This has been on the heart of several of us in the staff and so on. And we're glad to say we found people right here in the congregation. That's all I'll say. Folks right here that had that same heart. And this prayer guide comes uh, from that sense that we need to ready ourselves and pray. And let me ask you to mark that and be vigilant to pray with us and get our hearts and our minds attuned and ready to hear and be obedient. A couple of other matters just very quickly. Uh, your church budget you can read the particulars uh, but i think with great wisdom we've got by consent moved along with our uh, co committee's unanimous uh, recommendation to just simply rather than trying to rebudget for this year 
as crazy as that would be, we're just simply affirming the budget we had last year and we'll carry that on this year. We can make adjustments as we need. I think this is really sound leadership. I wanna thank these people who have worked so very hard and I'm very, very appreciative and we'll work and carry on the same budget. We can affirm these matters when we get back to having regular business meetings. And finally, let me encourage you to give, to be faithful. Your testimony and giving has been a, a, a lifeline and a, and a vitality to this church. I'm grateful, so grateful, so touched by your gratitude and faithfulness. Let me encourage you to keep being faithful. Let's pray together and join our hearts Lord Jesus, we are grateful, grateful to be your people, grateful to be gathered in this, in this sanctuary, grateful to have others join us, and their hearts and spirits are with us. And Lord, for these moments when we can lift your voice, open your word, join together as your body, and celebrate your goodness and your presence to us. We are we are grateful, indeed, all of your promises have their yes in you. And so, Lord, be here with us. Bind us together as one. And, Lord, help us manage even the Internet problems and everything else that's going on. Let nothing distract us from the privilege of being gathered with your people around you. We give thanks in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, it's good to have you. Thank you, you can be seated. We're, gonna, we're so thankful that you're here and uh, as we've gone through months and months and months of being apart, it's so nice to see, well, it's nice to see most of your faces. We see about from here up but that's okay, you're here and we see smiles in your eyes and we know that that smile is under the mask as well. So thank you for being here. Um, we may have been separated by miles, by walls between us, by uh, viruses that kept us from getting together. But throughout all of that, we know that our Lord never, never left us. He's always with us. And that's, this next song reminds us of that so much. My Lord is near me all the time. In the lightning flash across the sky, His mighty power I see.
The next song we'll sing is one that I first learned probably 20 years ago at a Promise Keepers event in St. Louis back when we were living in, in Kentucky. And I'll tell you that what reminded me of this, and I've, we've sung it before, so it's not going to be like we haven't done it since, ni- since 20, uh, 2000. But what reminded me of the song is the shirt that Beth was wearing last week. And it said, not Jesus loves me, this I know, but Jesus knows me, this I love. What a great thing that we recognize. Our Lord knows us. That's the song.
uh, picked another new one to sing, so we haven't done this one before, but I've been hearing it on the radio a lot. I really like it. I'm sure you guys will too. It's called The Blessing, and uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and now that Brian's ready, we can go.
All God's people said, Amen. 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 Or Amen, right? As we sang it. So good, so good to be with you. And we're doing a little technical things. And Brian, thank you for uh, making all this happen. But I'm delighted to be with you and delighted to share with you this morning. Delighted to hear your worship. It is a beautiful, beautiful song to hear. And I think the Lord is pleased that you're offering that song and that worship. And so anyway, it's good, it's so good to be with you. Thank you, Brian, again. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew, the 21st chapter. And we'll see there that Jesus has been sort of, well, acting rowdy, flexing his muscles doing all sorts of things for which some at least think he has no special training or no prerogative, no privilege to do. And they call him on it, and oh, how things backfire. They're meaning to shame him. They're intending to humiliate him and bring him down a notch and zing him on this place where he is vulnerable. He is not a trained rabbi. He has no great distinction and so on. And strangely enough, this untrained upstart rabbi turns the tables on all those who have supposedly the authority. Authority is sort of funny that way. It, it's all woven together with power, but the two are distinguishable, to be sure. I've got actually uh, some talks about that along the way. I'm not going to drag you through, but let me just say it's a complicated relationship, but there's a certain kind of authority that comes from an authentic place where you know what your authority is and you're being true to the voice that God has given you and true to the conviction God has given you, and you speak from that voice, and frankly, it doesn't matter who else is with you or what the reception is, you're being faithful to God. And then there's another kind of authority, and these, these experts of the law, these temple administrators, they have the clout, they have the rank, they have the legal sort of authority, but you find out very quickly that somehow they're missing an authentic authority. So they can just rest on power 
and they find themselves lacking. If you'd read with me this text, again from Matthew, the 21st chapter, we read these words, starting with verse 23. Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priest and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things, they ask? And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. And if you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. Now here's the question, verse 25. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or did it have merely a human origin? Now notice this per provoked the ones who are in charge and thought they would be asking the questions to sort of conference among themselves, realizing they had great vulnerability here. Here's what they're discussing. They discussed among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, then he will ask, why didn't you believe in him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people for they hold John was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, a certain kind of nerve and cowardice in one sense that they so boldly speak this way, but a, a lack of courage on the other, nerve but not really courage. They just say, we, we don't know. <laughs> is it they don't know? Is it they can't say? Is it they won't say? Jesus answers them, neither will I tell you what authority by which I'm doing these things. And it would have been bad enough to end there. One of about five or so kind of conflicts with the uh, authorities that are being jammed into these next several passages. Would it be enough there that they lost this contest and they had egg on their face and they were humiliated? They demonstrated that they didn't really have a kind of an authority and the person who spoke from his heart actually rang true and seemed to resonate with God and, and, and seemed to be in step with him, but they seemed to be out of step and out of focus and now they look pitiful and shameful and if it would have ended there, it would be bad enough, but Jesus follows up with this story. Verse 28, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, the son answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son, the other child, the text literally says, I think, and said the same thing. And he answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Now, Jesus reasons this way. Which of the two did what his father wanted? Which executed the will of the father? The first they answered. And Jesus said to them, perhaps reflecting on John the Baptist. And maybe that's in mind. Truly, I tell you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. Jesus speaks with the genuine authority and so did John the Baptist and Jesus went there because not just uh, it would put them into an awkward predicament but because it was sort of special in terms of what was going on in the world and the way God was rolling out the new initiative in Jesus 
John the Baptist saw himself in these certain terms. You can't miss it. Those of you who go to Sunday school remember the way he was dressed and what he ate and so on and where he hung out. And there's an unmistakable sort of echo to Elijah the prophet. And Elijah was this great prophet when Israel had abandoned faith in God and had suffered apostasy and rebelled and abandoned God. And there was a prophet, though, that called them back and called them to identity. John the Baptist also echoes passages from Isaiah and passages from Malachi. He sees himself as the one who will go before this great Messiah who is coming to, to announce the way, to announce the kingdom. And part of what that means in the ministry of John the Baptist is that he would call together and, and suggest that while they were spiritually dead and they had forfeited their place before God by their terrible disobedience, that God would still do his great work and God would bring this great purpose. And he would call a people to repentance. And they would leave their lives of abandonment and they would come and rally behind God's purpose, be a part of the new kingdom that was being initiated. And John gathered this people and baptized them as a sign of forgiveness. This must have called, caused a lot of confusion. It seems to short circuit the folks back there that operate the temple. But John didn't seem to need their permission. He acted with authority. He was announcing the kingdom of God. And the idea is this. The kingdom of God is coming. God's new initiative is here. The, the forerunner is here. And yet I'm playing that role. And I am announcing the one who will come after me. And you can gather yourself as a people and be constituted as the new people of God. And God can bring you in and restore you and ready you, forgive you, and ready you, you to be his people again. And they would have none of it. It was out of their uh, sort of scope and out of their routine. It disturbed their sense of power and their sense of control. They were the ones who had, by the way, all the legal credentials and they had the long tenure of service. They had all these things going for them and the whole thing just seemed offensive. To have this upstart come from nowhere. And they could not appreciate and could not discern God's voice and if they did, they were even more guilty. And so Jesus zings them on authority, and then Jesus brings things even further with this story about the two sons. There are the good boys and good girls who do things right and say, yes, yes, I'll do that. They seem compliant at every turn. And then at crucial moments, they seem to falter. Then there are bad boys and bad girls and they do the worst kind of reckless rebellion and defiance of God and go their own way. But in the parables idea, this wayward child, this wayward son repents. His heart and mind are changed. And he goes and does what the father said. And the brutal reality of the story is there before Jesus' opponents. They know for sure who the one is that's faithful to do God's purpose. Rabbis uh, discuss this um, kind of a question. Um, there's a conversation or two that's captured. Uh, some would suggest that if we're the child of God, we're the child of God. There's just not anything that's ever going to interrupt that. There's others who suggest that, no, you can forfeit your status as a child. And if you don't comply and follow and show respect for your, for your father and your mother, if you don't show uh, respect for, for, for God, if you, if you don't show sense, some sense of appreciation, no sense of obedience, no share, sense of shared sort of uh, in, in investment and vision, then frankly, you're just not a child anymore. And Jesus' teaching seems to correspond with the last of those. He suggests 
that these uh, folks with authority, folks with a fine religious pedigree, folks that want to look and be appropriate and, and be fitting and, and respectable, wow, can it be that they could disqualify themselves because they just can't get this idea that God wants to gather the broken and the rebellions of this world and bring them back to himself. And strangely, these religious folk are on the outside looking in. They're the folks who said, yes, yes, but when God acts, they just say, no, no, no not that. And strangely enough, in the, in the preaching of both John the Baptist and also in the preaching of Jesus, it's the folks that are rowdy and disqualified who seem not to have a religious leg to stand on, who come and hear Jesus. There's a Zacchaeus who never thought anybody could ever put him back into commission. There's again and again these folks who are on the outside looking in, but they hear about Jesus and they come to Jesus and they embrace faith. And everybody ought to be happy, but not everybody's happy. I'm here to celebrate faith and the goodness of God, and I'm grateful for it. But it does occur to me that I'm a person with religious pedigree. I have an office, and I have a degree. I've served churches. <laughs> there are even some people that think I've behaved. My wife is here today, and she knows better, but there's a lot of people think I generally behave. Most people would score me with the respectable, decent folk in the world. Never robbed the convenience store or done the drugs and was a pretty good kid. I cared about what my dad and my, what my mother might think. I sort of cared about what God would think even back then. I was mostly sometimes just scared, more scared than anything else, but that's not bad medicine, really. I'm trying to say I didn't get way out of line. I don't have the rap sheet that the tax collector and the prostitute have. And such a story sort of worries me. Will I sort of count one day on my good behavior? Hope sort of God grades on the curve? It could be easy for me to say, let's just grade on the basis of a long-term steady behavior where you didn't act out a lot, right? But it would not do, not even for some straight and narrow folks like me. I not only didn't inhale, I didn't take it in the first place. And uh, the truth is this, uh, I, I was uh, a good kid and I, I played it pretty straight and so on along the way, but I just wanna tell you, I know enough about myself and I know enough about what goes on deep in my heart and I know my spirit towards God and I know how I can reject him and, and I know I can see him at work and say please not now God not me what what is going on here I, I want to know I want you to know I've got that in my heart and maybe I didn't do the worst of things maybe I was a faithful at part sometimes maybe I was just scared I was cowardness had cowardness wasn't a courage of my conviction sometimes I just didn't know what to do or how to but I want to tell you, even with my good instincts that have, and good upbringing that have helped me in so many, so many, so many ways, I know in me, in the depth of my heart, somebody who knows and hopes with all of my being, it's like Jesus says. It's like this. Folks who've said no, folks who've wandered astray, folks who've forfeited their first chance at obedience, right? 
folks who went their own way, uh, folks who have uh, disqualified themselves, folks who have got rowdy and done, done things they're not, uh, they're not proud of and, and done things they ought to be ashamed of, folks who have really, 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 really said no to God with sort of a high-handed defiance. I'm so glad Jesus teaches it this way, that God can take those folks And announce his kingdom and his purpose of restoring the world and restoring the lives of his broken people. Even the sinful, rebellious people, God welcomes home in Jesus Christ. Wow. I need that. And uh, just because I think I might be a a head on... uh, points or maybe most folks don't see the the wrongdoing I've done and and maybe I look uh, like I have credentials and so on I don't don't want to tell you I don't want to ever stand on credentials I I don't really have any hope for me with credentials I I know down deep within me the spirit of rebellion against God and I just want to say I know the only hope I have is that Jesus has got it right and that this God can take the wayward child who said no and bring him back home. So who's in step with God? Who's got authority? It ends up being the people who can see the grace of God spilling out and going places that, frankly, we would never necessarily predict. And some of the most unlikely of people taking this word from God and seizing on with it with their very being and not feeling disqualified anymore, but being welcomed into the the kingdom of God. And Jesus had this effect on people. And I just want to tell you, that's got to be the rhythm of who we are in our faith. That's got to be the rhythm of who we are in our personal lives. That's got to be the rhythm of who we are in our church. And the vision that God can restore the broken people of the world is the vision that you need as a people going forward, following your new leadership and your pastor as you find your way and seeing the world around you. This must be the thing that gives us joy and gives us satisfaction. And we know we belong to the Father, not because we've stood here and checked the boxes along the way, but we have captured the heart of God to look and see the mercy of God at work, transforming people who have said no and no and no. And yet when the kingdom word gets loose on them, they see a hope of life they've never known and never seen. And they cling to Jesus Christ and he remakes them and he redeems them, forgives them and restores them and begins the journey of life and flourishing in service. And I just want to say to you, I need it so desperately to be the way Jesus said. I want to ask you, ponder this, that an old preacher, he was a preacher in Syria. Isn't that interesting? Up until about the 400s and then in Constantinople, and this famous preacher, Chrysostom, they call him, the golden mouth preacher, he says it this way, it is an evil thing not at first to choose the good, but it is worse not even to change afterwards. And so his punchline is, let no man of them that live in vice despair. And let no man who lives in virtue slumber. The kingdom has come, and we must all, all be ready to take joy in what God is doing. No despair. No despair. That gets hard for a season like this, doesn't it? But no despair. Are you you happy with... uh, uh, the way people around you are behaving? Are you, are you happy with the world? Are you, or don't you sense its brokenness? 
But no despair, no despair. The gospel says we serve a God who can take the broken and wayward and bring them into the kingdom and restore them. No despair in our lives. There's no one here. who has suffered a wrongdoing that disqualifies them from the kingdom participation. And I'm here to tell you, don't despair. And I'm here to tell you, don't slumber. Don't be, be occupied with what we're doing and, and what's going on to miss the greatness and goodness of God. No despair, no slumber. There were two sons, and one said, you've got to be kidding. No way. I'm not doing that. And then later, his heart changes. His mind is open. And he goes to serve the Father. And some are saying, oh yeah, we're in. We've always been in. Oh yes, oh, yes Lord. We've grown accustomed to it. But when God acts, we can't be there to be counted. And Jesus leaves us with the haunting question. Now, which one, which one does the will of God? Just stand, please, and we'll sing. I serve and draw. pray for you and send you from this place but first let me ask is there anybody here that said no but God still redeemed anybody here amen amen anybody here who's hungry to see the gospel reach out and change people you're here are you here let's give praise to God for a Jesus calls us home and calls us to be the people of God. Lord, bless this, your people, and send them from this place with the joy and message of the gospel that sinners can come home. And may we live in that joy and in that hope and in that confidence we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. I see.